Perfect. Good evening, everybody. Again, welcome to today's um, seminar, lecture, talk, fireside chat. I am Jyoti Singhvi, and I am uh, on the board of the MIT Sloan Club of New York. Well, as we all know, work hours are getting longer and work itself is becoming more and more complicated. Teams need to coordinate across cultures and time zones and unexpected events like the pandemic, political turmoil, which we are literally in the midst of right now, happen regularly, unfortunately. How can we navigate these currents in our life serenely, calmly, and successfully? Dr. Rao gives us practical actions that we can start taking today. His wisdom is timeless and the steps are modern. Millions of people have listened to Dr. Rao's TED Talk and have attended his programs and workshops. He has one goal only. That is to help you experience life in an exponentially better way so that you can have a life which is much, much more successful, have better relationships, and enjoy more peace. Dr. Rao has a PhD from Columbia Business School, and his courses have been among the most popular and highest rated at many of the world's top business schools. His work has been covered extensively by major media worldwide. He is the author of two books, Are You Ready to Succeed? Unconventional Strategies for Achieving Personal Mastery in Business and Life, and another book, Happiness at Work, Be Resilient, Motivated, and Successful No Matter What. He's also the creator and narrator of the audio learning course, the Personal Mastery Program, Discovering passion and purpose in your life and work. Dr. Rao, welcome to this wonderful group of MIT Sloan and our friends tonight. And welcome, welcome. We're very, very excited to have you here today. Thank you, Jyoti. It's my pleasure to be here with you. And I love fireside chats. Perfect. All right, let's just get started. Okay. Now, can you, you the title is Eradicate Stress. Is that really possible? Or do you just mean lessen the stress we feel? Tell us a little bit more about it. If you apply all of the concepts that I share with you today, you will eradicate stress from your life. Poof, there will be no more stress. If you half-heartedly and desultorily apply or try to apply some of the techniques I share with you, stress will considerably diminish in your life. But to your answer, can you eradicate stress? Absolutely. Well, that's very heartening. Now, also so, unequivocal. Yes, absolutely. Now, what do you mean when you say that most people do not understand why they feel stressed? I mean, stress is stress, right? So what do we have no, to understand about stress it? Stress is stress in terms of how you feel. Stress is not stress in terms of why you feel you have stress. Now I've asked thousands of persons on six continents, are you stressed? Do you have stress in your life? And the majority of them said there's more stress in their life now than they've ever had. And then of course I follow up by asking, well, why do you feel stress? And they've got a bunch of reasons. I basically boiled them down into eight factors, which are not mutually exclusive, but fairly distinct. And those are things like financial, you know, they have uh, obligations and they don't think they have enough financial resources to meet them. Uh, relationship issues, typically with partner or spouse, but could be with children, relatives, in-laws, bosses, uh, colleagues, shareholders, you name it. Uh, then there are children issues. Children, of course, are bundles of joy sent to bring meaning to your life. But I'm sure the parents among you have noticed that children do the darndest things and they begin early. They poop right after you change them. They fall in love with the most inappropriate people. They drop out of school. So children can be a source of stress. Then you scare, there's career uh, and uh, your progress or lack of it in that. And there's health and a bunch of other factors like that. And invariably people feel this is the reason why I'm having stress in my life. But actually that's wrong. 
And this is so important, Jyoti, that I'm going to put it out and I'm going to wait till you get on my boat. The reason you feel stress in your life, and there's only one reason you feel stress in your life. Only one reason, okay? The only one reason you feel stress in your life is you have a rigid expectation that this is, way the, this is the way the universe should be and the universe is not playing ball with you. You think you should be able to meet all your expenses comfortably and uh, your bank balance just isn't big enough to support that. You think relationships with your spouse should be harmonious, free of conflict, loving, and you're having a major rocky point. Whatever it is, you want the universe to unfold the way you would like it to be, and the universe is not playing ball with you, and you resist it and resent it, and in that resistance and resentment, you create the stress in your life, and that's the only reason you have stress in your life. Wow. Now, that's, you know, what you just did is you took all this cloud of stress everywhere here, 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 and you micro pointed it to one thing that our expectations. Absolutely, and this is important. So I'm waiting for you to push back if you disagree with me. All right, let's have the audiences push back. If anybody disagrees with, so, so this is our audience participation time. Absolutely. Think yeah. about, think everybody, I invite you to think about why are you stressed? I mean, you don't have to tell us relationships, work, money, whatever. Why are you stressed? But then see, is it actually the expectation that you have is different from the reality? Is that your resistance? If you agree, just put it yes in the in the um, chat box. But if you want to push back, um, go ahead and let's let's take that as a conversation. And this is important because this is the core part of what I'm going to share with you. Yeah. So as everybody is putting their thoughts down. I want to see audience participation. Please put it in. Okay, maybe very interesting. Okay, people are still digesting that fact. Of course, yeah, it takes some time to process because it's yeah. so very different. Yeah, I agree. Very simple. So how we think about it, we think about it because there are these external factors, but those external factors are things that many other people also confront with little or no stress whatsoever. So why do you feel stress? Because that's not the way you want it to be. Absolutely. As I'm thinking about things that stress me out or other people are um, stressing out. Um, yes. Now, then is the way, so I'm hearing a lot of yeses, resonations, uh, uh, etc. As, so am I, okay, so should we just release our expectation of the reality? Or no. like, what's the next step? Like, what do you want us to do to release? Okay. The next step I want you to get your arms around is that you probably don't think of your life in this way, but I'm now inviting you to think of your life in this way. Your entire life has been nothing but an attempt to exert control over some part of your internal or external environment. You are a control freak. You may not like to think of it that way, but you are, and everybody on this call is. And I freely admit that you don't think of your life in this way, but I'm now inviting you to think of your life in this way. MIT Sloan Group, right? Why did you go to MIT Sloan? Because you had in the back of your mind the notion, well, you know, that's a prestigious degree. And once I get that, all kinds of doors will open up for me and that will benefit me financially and in other ways. Seems like a good idea. Let's do it. It was an attempt to control some part of your internal or external environment. Are you married? Why did you get married? Well, you saw this person and it felt good and you saw this person and thought about him or her and it felt good. And you did it again in 10 minutes and very soon it became an obsession. You thought, gee, if I get married, there's going to be love, companionship, great sex. Seems like a good idea, let's push it. It was an attempt to control some part of your internal or external environment. Everything but everything you do is an attempt to control some part of your internal or external environment. Do you run a business? Are you an entrepreneur? Why are you an entrepreneur? Well, maybe because you recognize that you are unemployable 
And you thought, gee, if I become an entrepreneur, I can make a lot of money. I can have greater flexibility. I can do what I want. There's a lot of prestige and so on associated with it. Let's go do it. It was an attempt to control some part of your internal or external environment. Everything but everything you do is and has been an attempt to control some part of your internal or external environment. And once again, I'm going to pause for you to digest it because this is crucial. So, so very interesting. I'm going to take, this is an extension of what you're saying, Keir's question in the audience. So he said, wouldn't argue with that, what you're saying, especially with the research that you've done, but I think more interesting is why those expectations exist. Is it internal or external? And if it's external, how do we resolve? And if it's internal, wouldn't that be a driving force? Now you're going much deeper into my conversation, into our conversation. So why don't we hold that for a few minutes while I make a few points and then we'll come back to what do you do about it? Right now, I'm just trying to establish what is happening. Yeah. And after we've done that, then we'll talk about what do we do about it. Yeah. So let me then take this question, which are two people have raised a similar question. What about causes of stress out, of, outside of our expectations, like uncontrolled? Say that again? What about causes of stress outside of expectations, uh, uncontrollable external factors, poor health, death, I mean, the war? Um, or constraints, not enough time. Amrita. Those are not external circumstances. They fit right in with what I talked about. You want a peaceful world with no uh, friction, but that's not what we've got, especially not now. Mm. And also, you would I mean, like to be like in a country which is peaceful, and maybe you find yourself in a country that's been invaded. But it doesn't matter. You expect the universe to be a particular way, and it's not the way you would like it to be, either in your immediate personal circumstances or in the broader geopolitical sense. Mm. Interesting. Interesting. We're all digesting all these thoughts, uh, yeah. and, and I think that makes sense. Now, is that leading us to that illusion of control where we think? See, we what happens is all of us are control freaks. We want to ex exercise control over our internal or external environment. And the one thing that I would like to share with everyone is you do not have control. You never had control. You never will have control. Control is a myth. Control is an illusion. It does not exist. You only have the illusion of control. Let me repeat that. Control does not exist. You never had control. You never will have control. And you do not have control. You only have the illusion of control. Let me tell you something about the illusion of control. And then I, I get tremendous pushback and, uh, when I may say this. And you've got to understand that I've taught at some of the top business schools in the world, Columbia, London Business School, Kellogg, Berkeley, Imperial College. So very, very sharp cookies and uh, they push back. I also talked at several MIT uh, forums. So you know, your school is right up there. So uh, to uh, back up a little bit, the illusion of control comes about because many times in your life you said, well, I'm here at A and I want to go over at B. And if I do X, Y, and Z, I'm go going to get from A to B. And you did, and you did go from A to B. That's happened many times in your life. That's happened many times in the lives of persons close to you. So you say, see, we did it. We have control. In reality, any of a number of things that could have happened to derail you did not happen. So be very grateful because I'm sure everyone can recall sometime in their life and something happened which is so totally unexpected that it threw all of your plans into a cocked hat. It has happened before and it will happen again. Now the illusion of control, the notion that you can control things is wonderful. I am not knocking it at all. It's a wonderful device. It's because of the illusion of control that you get up in the morning, you make plans, you execute on those plans, 
That's why you have a to-do list. That's why you have, you're building up your career as an entrepreneur or whatever you're doing. It's wonderful. But use the illusion of control knowing that it is the illusion of control because sometime it's going to break down. It has before and it will again. It's not a question of will it break down. It's a question of when will it break down. And when you use the illusion of control, knowing it's the illusion of control, when it breaks down, you simply say, ah, this is when it broke down. What do I do now? Whereas if you use the illusion of control, not knowing that it's the illusion of control, that's when you go to pieces. And the pushback I get is frequently, Professor Rao, you're going too far. I know I can't control things completely, but you know, I have influence. Or maybe I can't control it, but, uh, you know, I have a probabilistic uh, 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 expectation of this is what will happen. That's like saying I'm a little bit pregnant. If it makes you happy to think that way, by all means do so. But the bottom line is you really don't have control because all kinds of unexpected things could happen and do happen. In a way, the pandemic is a perfect illustration of that. Uh, I am a tennis fanatic. I've been to the French Open numerous times, to the Australian Open, go to the US Open every year. Last year was the day that uh, we decided to go to Wimbledon. And those of you who know about this, if you want to get good seats for the final rounds of Wimbledon, that's not an expense, that's a capital investment. But I bought my tickets a long time ago. And at that time, somebody had said, Sri Kumar, you won't be able to go see Wimbledon because you don't have control. And I said, yeah, sure, possible. But in my head would have been something like perhaps someone close to me fell ill as a result of which I had to cancel my trip. I never imagined that I would not go to Wimbledon because the tournament itself was canceled. And further, there were no planes flying between New York and London. The pandemic has brought home to you in a visceral sense how little control you have. Because even when people superficially accept what I say, I don't have control, you're generally thinking along, well, my son applied to Harvard and he doesn't have very good grades, so I don't know if he's going to get in, I don't have control. Or my marriage is a bit shaky and I don't know if it'll survive, I don't have control. But even as you say that, you are embedded in a worldview where you have a great deal of control. Like, if I am hungry and there's no food in the house, I'll go to a restaurant and order on the menu. If I run out of toilet paper, I'll hop over to the corner grocery store and pick up a roll. The pandemic has caused even such basic things to come to question. People in the Ukraine now are thinking, gee, I thought I had a bed to sleep in. Do I anymore? That's when you realize when you have political uncertainty of the extent which we are having in many parts of the world, when you have stuff like the pandemic come, that's when you truly realize, no, I do not have control. That's again very important. So I'm going to pause while your audience processes this. So this illusion of control and knowing that we don't necessarily have control, should we just give up? No. Should we, I mean, it's it's also kind of like translating, like taking me to the karma theory. And I don't know if there are parallels here. I'll keep doing what I have to do, but whatever is supposed to destined to happen will happen or- if Exactly correct. What happens is you have a vision of the world. This is how the world should be. And in your vision of the world, there's a starring role for you. As long as you have a vision of the role, a vision of this is the way the world should be, it is incumbent upon you to try your level best to bring that about. You may succeed, you may not succeed. If you succeed, fantastic. If you do not succeed, fantastic. You try your level best having fully accepted that you do not have control. The universe will do what the universe thinks should happen and it may or may not coincide with what you would like to have happen. 
And whatever the outcome is, you have accepted that outcome in advance through a conscious process of, of uh, <clears throat> uh, thinking about it. You ratiocinate. And once you have thought about it and you accept it, this is what I would like to have happen, whether it actually will or not, I don't have a clue, but I'm going to give it my best shot. And if it succeeds, wonderful. If it doesn't succeed, wonderful. Because, and this is important, Jyoti, most of us think the benefit of setting a goal and trying our level best to achieve the goal is achieving the goal. Wrong. Achieving the goal is an outcome. And as we've just discussed, you have no control over that whatsoever. You can do everything by the book and something totally unexpected can happen or you can do everything wrong and somehow or other it still works out. So the benefit of setting a goal and trying your level best to achieve the goal is the learning and growth that happen in you and to you as you try your level best to achieve the goal. If you actually achieve the goal, that is a bonus. Be immensely grateful. If you don't achieve the goal, the learning and growth have already happened, so you're ahead of the game. It's a no-lose proposition. And once you embrace that, once you truly embrace that, not just intellectually say, hey, that makes good sense. If you can truly embrace it, then you'll find that there is no stress. You have a goal, you try your level best to reach that goal, but you're not obsessed about the destination. You know it's not under your control, but you try your level best because that's where your learning and growth come in. And then you find every day is a blast. And there is no stress. And other people around you will be saying, what is the secret sauce you have? Can I have some of that too? So that's a very easy breezy way to look at it. I mean, it's not easy when you start performing, uh, practicing it. It takes a lot of practice. It reminds me of what's said in Gita, karm karte ja phal ki chinta mat kar, which is what you also say, Exactly. That's in the process, not in the outcome. Mm -hmm. Now, how does that tie in to the goals that we have at work or goals we have for our families, etc.? You, you miss the goals or the milestones, but you should still be happy about the, the learning. How do you... Miss missing the goal or not missing the goal is not under your control. The best that you can do is the best that you can do. And you do and say, okay, the universe is going to decide whether or not it works. And uh, I've given it my best shot and I'll continue giving it my best shot. Let me put it to you this way, Jyoti. If ever there was a person who should have been feeling enormous stress, it was General Dwight David Eisenhower on June 4th, 1944, Eve of D-Day. Literally, there were thousands of boats carrying hundreds of thousands of men waiting for him to order them on. There were thousands of planes ready to drop tens of thousands of paratroopers over France. In a very real sense, the fate of the world depended on the decisions of one man. So that guy should have been feeling an enormous amount of stress, right? On the contrary, he went to sleep and uh, you know, he said, I slept like a baby. And later on, when he was interviewed about that, he said, I picked the very best generals I had and put them in charge of the different sectors. I picked the very best meteorologists they were and asked for their best forecasts. And having done everything that I could do, I said, okay, now they will execute and I will sleep, and he did. You really have to think about it and think about it until it's not an intellectual conviction, but something that you're rooted in. And it's when you're rooted in that you will find that it's a tremendous reliever of stress. Stress simply leaves your life, poof. 
interesting. I think, yeah, it's, it's just taking everybody a little bit of time to just kind of come to terms with what you're saying. Henry here has a pushback. Uh, he said, this is, I think this is very Zen. I want to recognize that there are people, perhaps not on this call, who are in duress and are in duress enough that their needs are not just merely wants or expectations, but actual needs. What are they going to do? And, and this conversation has taken a very different turn today because of Ukraine, I believe. And then, I mean, I mean, we've been in the pandemic for almost two years, but because of Ukraine, the conversation takes a different turn. Uh, how, how do you address something like that? Oh, there are always people under duress, yeah. but I would advise everyone on this call not to intellectualize the problem. And let me tell you what I mean by intellectualize the problem. I was speaking to a group there and there was someone out the audience. And I got the feeling that she was asking a question not because she wanted an answer, but it was her way of uh, her one-upmanship. I said, Professor Rao, you know, here's this farmer in Bangladesh and there have been floods and the floods have completely uh, <clears throat> uh, drowned his cattle. His, he's lost his family. He's... Uh, can no longer grow crops because the what these farms of sodden. What does he have to gain from anything you say? So what this person has actually done is thought about a scenario that someone else is facing, try to put himself in, herself in that person's shoot, and then saying it poss couldn't possibly work, and then trying to broaden that. That's what I mean by intellectualizing the problem. So don't think in terms of, is this gonna help that person who's under grave duress? The only person who has a right to ask the person, ask that question is that person who is under grave duress. Ask yourself, does this work for me? And don't try to broaden it into, does it work for this other person whose situation I'm imagining? Got it. Got it. Thank you. So when somebody, let's, let's take a step back. Okay, so there is some kind of mismatch of expectation, not meeting goals, duress, whatever it is. Can we talk about the steps we can take to actually get rid of that stress? Step one being just release that expectation and make peace with what the reality is. It's not that easy to release expectations, okay? I said that you can eradicate stress. I never said that it would be easy or fast. Mm -hmm. But if you truly ponder on what I have said and you truly accept that, no, I really do not have control and you're in there, then when the world shows you that you don't have control, it is no longer a surprise. It's no longer a nasty surprise. It's simply something that you've already accepted is within the bounds of possibility, so you're okay. It's like you see a horror movie and you know where the killer is there and you know he's got a knife. So when he springs out, hey, it's no longer a surprise. It may be unpleasant, but it's not a surprise because you already knew. In exactly the same way, you go through life and uh, you accept that you don't have control and stuff could happen. You know, the Muslims have a wonderful cultural context, which is anytime they make a declarative statement, they always say, inshallah, if this be the will of Allah. I'm going to meet you for dinner on Friday, Jyoti, inshallah. Now, if you pause to think about it, what it means is an explicit acknowledgement that we make plans, but nothing is under our control. And if it is to happen, it has to happen because it's the will of Allah. Mm. So that's a wonderful cultural custom. Unfortunately, what's happened is that even among many Muslims that I know, uh, they use the term and it's now become mechanical. And even worse, sometimes you use it mockingly to say, it's not going to happen, inshallah. And you say that. When you do that, you remove a lot of the power. In fact, you remove all of the power of this wonderful custom. But if you pause and acknowledge, yes, you know, we are going to meet for dinner, inshallah. You have that brief acknowledgement, it may happen, it may not happen. And when you're grounded in that, you'll find that no matter what happens out there, you simply say this happened and how do I cope with it? 
you have to consciously make this a part of your worldview. And when you do that, you will find that stress is diminished. And when you're completely accepting of that, there is no stress. This happened. So it's almost like a decision tree instead of a decision tree, it's a probability tree. A certain percentage of probability that this would happen, probability this would happen, and I should be ready in my mind for yeah. any of the outcomes to happen. Let me just drive hard or drive happily, joyously towards the direction I wanna go in, but I may end up in any direction. Exactly correct. So- you head off to Connecticut and you land up in Florida, enjoy the beach. Enjoy the beach. It's, it's all God's will or universe's will. Now that leads me also then, um, our, our conversation is very, very, as you know, between you and I, it's very fluid. Um, this is not what we had discussed, but I'm just taking it where it's going. So now this leads me to the law of attraction. How does that apply to what you're saying? Because in law of attraction, which many claim that it's kind of like the law of gravity, whatever you put out there, the universe kind of transpires to bring that to you. Um, so if you have put something out there with the right intensity, whether it's negative or positive, you're going to attract that in your life. So if we are, if we are prepared for all the outcomes, we're putting, we're prepared both for the negative, mid or the positive, we're hoping for the positive out there. So now we're not, our, our, our focus, the law of attraction has to be focused. Our focus is not on the most positive. Um, so it's getting confused, right? So it's negating itself. How does that play out? Let, let me, you've asked a very deep question and I don't have time to answer all of that, but let me make uh, one important point. You can have anything you want in your life. You don't necessarily get it at level one. Yeah, good point. And let me explain by that. Let's say I want to be a Wimbledon champion. I want to be a Wimbledon singles champion. That means I actually go out there and beat whoever is the other qualifier, other finalist to become Wimbledon singles champion. Extraordinarily unlikely that's ever going to happen. So that's level one. Level two is why do I want to be Wimbledon singles champion. What does that represent to me? Does, do I need the money? Do I crave the fame? Do I want to show up my father who said I'll never get any place in tennis? What is the need? What does that represent to me? Level three is, and why do I want that? Obviously you can go down many levels, but for most purposes, three or four is more than enough. It's at level three that you can have anything that you want. And when you're talking about the law of attraction, the results will frequently come at that level and not necessarily on level one. But you have to do a fair amount of introspection before you can honestly identify what is at level three. Can we just repeat those three or four questions that we should be thinking about again? Yeah, first of all, I want to X, whatever X is. I want to grow my company to a billion dollars. I want to have a personal net worth of a billion dollars. Level one is actually doing it. Level two is why does that matter to me? What am I really seeking? I want a billion dollars because that gives me security. Next level, why do I need that security? It does getting a billion dollars really give me that security. This is not something that you arrive at by thinking about it over a weekend, over a whiskey. This is something that you have to constantly probe before you start becoming comfortable with it. Well, once you do that, many of the ideas that I'm sharing with you, they're very powerful. They absolutely work. They've been tested over millennia, but you have to actively engage with them to incorporate them to be part of your worldview. And then they work in spades. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to draw our attention uh, to the flashlight model. 
I love that concept. Could you share that a little bit? Your awareness, Jyoti, is like a flashlight. What does a flashlight do? A flashlight illuminates whatever you shine it on, right? Shine it on the ceiling, it lights up the ceiling. Shine it on the floor, it lights up the floor. I'm going to ask you to take the flashlight of your awareness and shine it upon the chair in which you are sitting. Now, when you shine the flashlight of your awareness, the chair in which you are sitting, do you become conscious of the pressure of your buttocks on the seat? Can you feel the fabric or the leather against the back of your thighs? Yep. Yep. Okay, 30 seconds ago, you were not aware of any of this. Why are you aware of it now? Because you've shown the flashlight of your awareness on it. So what do we typically shine the flashlight of our awareness of? We typically shine it on the three, four, or five things that are wrong in our lives. More probably on the three, four of things that we think are wrong in our lives. These are the problems I'm facing. And you spend all of your flashlight energy on that. And what about the 40 things which are pretty damn good about your life? Do you have to bother about whether you have enough food to eat? Are you going to have dinner tonight? Do you have to think about where you're going to sleep tonight? Do you have a bed to sleep in, a roof over your head? Can you go from place A to place B with reasonable certainty that your home isn't going to get blown up? Obviously, yes, everybody listening to this is incredibly privileged, but you don't feel incredibly privileged. You feel put upon and stressed out. That's because of where you shine the flashlight of your awareness on. So starting immediately, shine the flashlight of your awareness on the many ways in which you are truly blessed and fortunate. I recommend doing this last thing at night before you go to bed. When you get up in the morning, don't go immediately to the place of there's too much to do and I don't have enough time to do it all. Shine the flashlight of your awareness on the many ways in which you're truly fortunate and do that many times during the day. And it is my hope that every one of you, everyone listening to this program will eventually occupy an emotional domain of appreciation and gratitude. And the reason that's important is when you're in the emotional domain of appreciation, gratitude, you're not angry, you're not nervous, you're not fearful, you're not anxious. The two just can't coexist. Can we, that's a really great point. Can we do that as a small exercise right now? Uh, Absolutely, yes, you can. Tell us what you want us to do. Oh, sit down in your chair, keep your feet on the ground, spine straight, take three, deep, deep breaths. And that then honestly start thinking about how fortunate you are. Go back to your schoolmates. I'm sure that many of your schoolmates will look at where you are now and say, boy, he or she has it made. What is it about your current situation that would lead them to say that you have it made? And think about those circumstances and be grateful that you are in that position. It's that simple. So what Dr. Rao is asking us to do is be grateful just in your minds for three to five things. They could be big or small. Let's just spend 30 seconds in that space. And then exactly. if you wouldn't mind sharing how that might have changed how you feel. Because we all came here mostly running from either work uh, if we're working from home, still running from work, giving snacks to kids or preparing for dinner or picking up kids if we have kids or from another meeting, we were all kind of often frazzled. How do we feel after that exercise of expressing gratefulness? I'd love to hear that in the chat box. So Dr. Rao, while we are waiting for our audiences, I will take one last question with you um, and then I will open it up to audience q and I apologize, I've not been able to take everybody's uh, or I have not been able to share everybody's comments or questions but we will have a, an opportunity to share that later. Mm -hmm. You had, so there's an example about Einstein that you share often. About? Um, Einstein, what did Einstein sure. say that is relevant to those of us who are not advanced scientists? How, like, tell us more about that please. 
We review Einstein as a great scientist. He was responsible for formulating or discovering the theory of relativity. He discovered the photoelectric effect for which he got the Nobel Prize. He didn't get the Nobel Prize for the theory of relativity. He got it because he discovered the photoelectric effect. So we respect him, but the theory of relativity and the photoelectric effect uh, resulted in inventions that we use, but directly it really doesn't have an impact on your life. I was a physics major, so I certainly enjoyed reading about the theory of relativity, but it didn't have an impact on me, on my life. Einstein was also a philosopher, and he had a pretty intricate view of how the universe functions. And Einstein posed a question to each one of us. He said, the most important question you will ever ask or answer is, is the universe friendly? Now let's get this straight. Einstein said, the most important question you will ever answer is, is the universe friendly? Now the vast majority of us live in a world where the universe doesn't know I exist and couldn't care less. Here I am going around doing my thing and there's the universe going around doing its thing. And sometimes it seems to help me, sometimes it seems to frustrate me, but essentially it's a random process. But what if the universe was actually aware that you exist? The universe knew you existed. And furthermore, the universe was friendly, it was well disposed towards you. Now friends don't shaft friends, do they Jyoti? If the universe was my friend, why does the universe give me stuff I don't want? I want to go on vacation and the universe gives me pandemics and lockdown. Why does the universe give me stuff I don't want? Well, what if it was a friendly universe and it gave you exactly what you needed, which may not be what you wanted? It's like you're a small child and you want a tub of ice cream, but your parents give you fruits and vegetables and you don't want fruits and vegetables. You want a tub of ice cream, but your parents give you fruits and vegetables. And it isn't until much later when you have a greater level of maturity and wisdom that you can say, thank God I got fruits and vegetables rather than a tub of ice cream. What if the universe was like that? It does not give you what you want, but it gives you exactly what you needed for your learning and growth. What if? Regardless of whether or not the universe is friendly, if you believe the universe was friendly, your experience of life would be immeasurably enhanced. And what if the universe actually was friendly? Your life would take off. Nothing would ever phase you because a friendly universe has given you stuff for your learning and growth. And your job is to get that learning and growth internalized as fast as you can. You would never be rebelling or resenting what came your way. You'd just be saying, okay, friendly universe gave it to me. Lesson here, what's the lesson? Let me learn it fast. And then you move on. That's why Einstein said the most important question you will ever ask is, is the universe friendly? And let me tell you, it's a heck of a lot better living in a friendly universe than the other kind. So that's really, thank you. That's very interesting um, to ponder. And it's just a different way and a different perspective of how we come at things, how we perceive things. That leads me to one of the audience questions by Larry Poster, who is also our president. Hi, Larry. And a similar question by Amrita, who are saying that then can stress actually be a motivator for success or can we use it as a mobilizer for success? You can use it as a mobilizer, but perhaps there's a better way. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a physics major. 
but despite the fact that I was a physics major, I loved poetry, I loved all the romantic, Shelley, Byron, Blake, Wordsworth. And if you look at the lives of all of these poets, they had a great deal of adversity. Byron had a club foot. He had to leave the country because he fell in love with his half-sister and that was frowned upon. Uh, da Vinci was persecuted for his uh, sexual orientation. Michelangelo was bossed around by tyrannical popes. Uh, Beethoven was deaf. If you look at their lives, they had tremendous, tremendous adversity. And it is to their immeasurable credit that centuries after they passed on, their works of poetry, art, sculpture, music, are still bringing joy to millions upon millions. But my question to you is simple. Would you rather be pushed by great pain or pulled by grand vision? You know you can be pushed by great pain to do wonderful things, but would you rather be pushed by great pain or pulled by grand vision? You decide. I love that outlook, really great, really great. Um, this has been incredible, Dr. Rao. Uh, I'm going to open it up to audience Q&A. Could you, before we do that, could you tell us what's the best way, wh where can we find more about you and maybe reach you? Um, Go to my website, it's www.theraoinstitute.com. There's a big red button which says join now. And if you click that and put in your email address, you'll get my blogs and information about my programs or, and just browse my website. There's a ton of stuff in there, including my blogs. And if you like what you see, then sign up and register. Perfect. And Dr. Rao does a lot of coaching also with corporations, professionals, uh, entrepreneurs, et cetera. Yes, I am an elite coach and I have an actual, actually have a very defined niche. I coach very successful people who really want to leave a dent in the universe, but who also have an explicit spiritual path. And they would like to infuse that into every aspect of their life. Very cool, very neat. Um, and definitely very neat. Okay, um, I am going to open this up to audience Q&A. So if you have a question, just un, um, again, I don't see the, uh, the hand raise, but maybe unmute yourself and ask your question. And I'm going to change the view here to gallery. Is everybody seeing a gallery view? There's a lot they have to absorb, Jyoti. <laughs> yes, there's a lot to absorb. Uh, but if there is a question that we couldn't take during the conversation, please feel free to ask now. And feel free to come on the camera for a few minutes if we'd love to see your lovely faces. Let me just take Henry's question here then. Um, I think we talk talked about this. This might be way out of scope, but to, how do you think about depression, hopelessness versus stress and anxiety? Do you think similar shifts in mindset can help both or, or do you think uh, that there are different ways to tackle them? A shift in mindset could certainly help both. Uh, I'm not a medical person, so what I'm giving you is an informed lay opinion, not a medical opinion. I think depression is simply many years or decades of allowing your mental chatter to run unchecked. And eventually it's become such a strong current that it's put you into a silo you can't break out of. But it all begins with many years or decades of unchecked, untrammeled mental chatter. Interesting. And then, and you're absolutely right, because once I started applying these techniques or similar techniques, I realized that it was very small, you know, unchecked chatter, which led to something big, which was not very desirable. And now to, to, to um, chip off on it, it's like chipping off on a big mountain. It takes a little time. Uh, could you tell us what can we do in our daily lives now 
maybe make it a daily practice or weekly practice. You tell us what you want us to do. How long should we do something for? Oh, absolutely. Before, before I do that, I'd like to share something with you. Sure. When I was teaching at London Business School. One of my students was the uh, head of the department of psychiatry at a major hospital. And they had a bunch of patients that they had pretty much given up on in the sense of, you know, there's nothing we can do for them. Let's just manage their condition. And he said, on a whim, he took some of the exercises that he learned in my course and said, let's apply it and see what happens. And he said that he was very pleasantly surprised to find that many of them actually started responding. So one data point. Uh, with regard to what people can do, a whole bunch of things. Uh, first and most important is shine the flashlight of your awareness. Be aware of where you're shining it. And too much of the time, you're shining it on the stuff that's uh, designed to take you to an emotional domain where you're angry, anxious, scared. You know, you, you idly turn on the news and you hear about bloodshed and fighting and immediately you go to, oh my God, what's the world coming to and where is us all going to lead? It's a downward spiral. So by all means, turn on the news, but recognize you're doing it for information. Recognize that the newscaster can take you down this vortex, but he can't take you down that vortex if you are an observer rather than a participant. And you say, I'm getting this for news, but you know, I'm not gonna go down that uh, downward spiral of despair. Then you get your information without getting sucked into the emotional downdraft. Constantly be monitoring your thought and see how many times an external stimulus can hijack you if you let it. But if you're on your guard, you'll find that you notice it it no longer has any ability to take you to places you don't want to go. Practice being grateful for the enormous number of ways in which you truly bless it. Recognize that you're going to try your level best to achieve whatever goal you want, but whether or not you succeed is not under your control and never was. And you're okay with that. And when you're okay with that, but you're still trying your level best, you find that you enjoy the process of doing it. Because when you focus on the actions that you have to undertake, you begin to enjoy the journey. Normally, you're so obsessed with the outcome, the destination, that you ignore the journey. But in reality, the journey is the only thing you have. The journey is with you always. I'm taking notes for everybody as you're speaking. So. Um... Excellent. And this is very, very helpful. Uh, I hope we can copy and paste and send this out. This is great. Um, what other, um, do we have any other questions? I can ask more, but I'm I surprised that an MIT audience doesn't have questions. Larry has a question. Larry, go yes. ahead. Um, fascinating uh, topic and brilliantly uh, said. I very much appreciate it. Would like to know what was your journey to this point? Was this something that you arrived at slowly? You always knew? Or was there an aha moment? And if the latter, was there an event that precipitated that moment? Or exactly how did you get to where you are? And That's a very good question, Larry. Uh, when I, I graduated with a PhD from Columbia Business School. I entered the corporate world and I was hugely successful. When I say hugely successful, I mean my career took off like a rocket. Uh, I was in my early 20s, 23, when I was head of corporate research for Warner Communications reporting directly to the president. So, you know, heady days, wonderful. I got burnt out by corporate politics. So I went to academia thinking there would be no politics in academia. I was sadly mistaken. I think it was Henry Kissinger who said, the reason the fighting is so, sh so uh, the knives are so sharp in academia is because the stakes are so low. He got it on absolutely right. And then I stagnated while all my colleagues who remained in the corporate world climbed the hierarchy and did well financially. And I was stuck as a professor with cost of living increases and I was married and I had children and there were all kinds of uh, pressures. 
And I remember thinking, gee, I've blown it. I had such a wonderful education, such a great early start, and I've ruined it, and my life is over. A wonderful pity party won. Now, all my life, I'd been doing a lot of reading, spiritual biography, mystical autobiography. They take me to a wonderful place, and I came back to the real world, and it sucked. And I remember thinking, if all of this is useful, only if you're sitting quietly thinking peaceful thoughts, but not when you came to the hurly-burly, then it's useless. Somehow I knew that wasn't useless. I knew this was valuable. Maybe even the only thing that was valuable, I just hadn't figured out how to make use of it. So one day I got my bright idea, which is why don't I take the teachings of the world's great masters, strip them of religious, cultural, and other connotations and adapt them so that they're acceptable to intelligent people in a post-industrial society. And the thought of doing that made me come alive. So I created that course for me. My initial thought was, I teach MBAs. We all know what motivates MBAs. Nobody's going to enroll for the course, and that is fine. If they did, wonderful. If they didn't, God bless them. I was going to create the course because I needed it for me. So I did. I moved, and it did well. So I moved it to Columbia Business School in 1999, and it exploded. It was the only course at Columbia Business School, which was a university-wide draw. I had students from law school, business school, School of International and Public Affairs, from journalism, teachers college, all over the place. And then it spread by word of mouth. Students from London Business School came to Columbia on exchange and they went back and said, this is a great course, you've got to have it. So it migrated. I taught it at uh, London Business School, I taught it at Kellogg, I taught it at Berkeley, I taught it at Imperial College, and that became so popular, I spun it out and uh, started teaching it privately. And simultaneously, I developed an international uh, coaching practice, and it all happened organically. So that's the process. Thank you. Thank you. It was very insightful to hear, um, you know, the journey because that helps us um, kind of understand and draw parallels in our own lives. Um, any last questions we have from the audience before we ask Dr. Rao for his last words of wisdom? Um, for the evening before we all depart for dinner. Any other audience questions? Anybody? Um, I'm not seeing everybody. So if you want to unmute yourself and speak. Um, all right. Uh, so I guess not, but this was very, very profound, eye-opening, lots of new things for us to think about, digest, absorb start implementing. Uh, I highly recommend that you um, sign up for Dr. Rao's uh, you know, email newsletter because that's very, very insightful and that will keep us on track with some of the things that uh, you have, um, we have heard today from Dr. Rao. Any last parting words of wisdom, Dr. Rao, you wanna share with Absolutely. us? Absolutely, it's a short life. Every day you get up and your blood isn't singing at the thought of being who you are and doing what you do when you're not radiantly alive, is a day wasted. And life is too short to waste. Thank you so much. So be happy. Don't lead a waste. Oh. Exactly. Thank you so much, Dr. Rao. My Do pleasure, Jyoti. And have oh. a great trip. And everyone wishing you a terrific evening. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank Bye. you for joining us, everyone. Really appreciate your time and your questions and your interest. Thank you.